In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, both now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. Glory to thee, our God. Glory to thee, O heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, who are everywhere, present of the soul, things, treasure, bliss, and giver of life. Come in abundance and close us may be in purity and save our souls, O good one. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Today we will continue <clears throat> with uh, the interpretation of the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 2, verse 16 to 20. We will actually continue with the book, with the epistle to the letter or the letter to uh, the, the bishop or to the church of Pergamos. And uh, we'll uh, try to continue and build up on what we said yesterday about the idol worshiping, the Nicolaitans, and the new forms of <coughs> idol worshiping. If you remember yesterday, we covered, let me just try to first uh, share my screen with you. We tried to cover the topic uh, about the, uh, let me go here, the plan to deceive Israel uh, through Baal and Balak, King Balak who called uh, Magi um, Baal to um, perform some sort of a ritual where he was going to challenge the Israeli people by falling, making them fall into two types of temptation. One was idol worshiping or worshiping a god, was not the, the god of Israel, and the one was through fornication, sexual pleasure. This type of temptation was the successful one, unfortunately. 24,000, 26,000 people were killed because of it by God, because God ordered Moses to remove those people from that, uh, from the tribes of Israel because they fell into uh, abomination. We, we had to cover this story that is actually described in the Old Testament in the book of Numbers, because when while we are reading the book of Revelation, we'll see a lot of revealed um, secrets, if you will, symbolism, things that happened in the past in the Old Testament so that can be relatable to the people who are going to read. So for, for today, we'll continue where we stopped the last time and we'll uh, try to uh, answer the, uh, the, uh, the interpretation of the chapter 2, verse 16 to 20. So let me just skip towards the that part. That's on... Uh, Slide uh, 37, we trying to kind of keep up with the with all the lessons so we can have everything covered. There, as you know, we had to kind of dissect a little bit, go slowly with the interpretation to the letters, because now we're continuing with our interpretation of the book of Revelation on the epistle to the Church of Pergamos, and to the Bishop of Pergamos. So let me just read, let me just read you the, um, this part of the, of the chapter, so we can kind of uh, go and then dig in. Repent then, or else, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him, who conquers, I will give some of the hidden mana, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone, which no one knows except him who receives it. And to the angel of the church of Thyatira, write, now we're moving to the Thyatira, but we'll have to talk about Pergamos as well. The words of the Son of God, who has eye like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze, I know your works, your love and faith, and service and patient endurance, and that your latter, uh, latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and beguiling my servants to practice immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. So we now continue with the analysis of the epistle that our Lord sent to the Bishop of Pergamos. I want you to know that, uh, just to re as a reminder, 
Uh, we're using the book of uh, the Seven Golden Lampstand by Father Archimandrit Athanasius Mytilineos, translated by Constantine Zalalas, as a guide in order to cover the book of Revelation. Our Lord had a complaint against the Bishop of Pergamos pertaining to the Nicolaitans. And we talked about Nicolaitans who were a typology of Balaam. They were just uh, using the word Nicolaitans. We said the word Nicolaos or Nicholas comes from the Greek word Nika, which means a victory, and Laos, which means people. So it is either the victory of the people or the victory over the people. So that's why... Uh, uh, they gave them the names Nicolaitans. He was their patron saint, so to speak. It was Balaam who had instructed Balak in the Old Testament to invite the Israelites to their festivities, to eat meat, sacrifice, it, sacrifice to idols, and then fornicate, which would bring them into disfavor with God and provoke him. God tells the Bishop of Pergamos, repent then. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. If you remember, the, this false prophet had issue. And here's see the picture that even the donkey that he had um, spoke with a, uh, with a human language. So I cannot proceed because I see an angel in front of me who doesn't allow me to move. And so he uses a trickery, if you will. He whispers into the ear of the, of the king, uh, allegedly thinking that uh, the God will not hear him what he has to say. However, uh, we're going to move on in order to uh, understand what is going on. There is a surprising, though, uh, though, here. Surprising is the fact that the Lord seeks full compliance in all his commandments and all his words. words. We see that the Lord admonishes this oversight of the Bishop of Pergamos, which is the failure to succeed in the catharsis or cleansing, of the church from the pollution of Nicolaitanism. You see, those Nicolaitans were basically Gnostics present um, in all of that area, uh, very uh, disguised, in, 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 you know, covered with abominations, who were trying to uh, penetrate or infiltrate the church and even seduce, if possibly, even the elect. That's why today, later on, we'll talk about Jezebel, who was a false uh, female prophet. Uh, prophet who uh, which tried to kind of do the same thing the lord wants the bishop to repent and rectify this error this uh, allowing the nicolaitans to take over the church in a way or to influence the the members of the church the members of the flock of the church the lord does not tolerate anything improper in his church which is his spotless and pure bride there is even a threat of punishment in the event that the bishop does not correct his actions if he does not repent and take the necessary precautions to protect his flock from the heretical influence of Nicolaitanism. This threat is the Lord himself will fight the heretics. In simple terms, the Lord tells the bishop that if he cannot take care of this, he will do it himself. This is an interesting approach. Uh, uh, interpreting this, St. Andrew of Caesarea says, in this quote, in this threat, we find philanthropy or love. Uh, for, for the humankind. I will not fight against you, but I will fight against those terminally ill with the disease of heresy. This is the quote from St. Andrew of Caesarea, uh, which is his commentary in Apocalypse. Uh, that we said that Paratanasius uh, uses him very much, and he's one of the most authoritative fathers of the church when it comes to the interpretation of the book of Revelation. Our Lord takes an unusual approach if we compare it to the other epistles where the Lord directs to threat to the bishop. I will punish you, he says. I will turn against you. I will move your lampstand and so on. To the bishop, he says, if you do not repent, oh, if you do not repent, I will turn against the heretics. The question is, why doesn't he go after the bishop if this bishop is at fault and, um, let's say, needs to repent, but instead stays that he will turn against the heretics? Common sense tells us that he should go against the bishop, which is very logical. However, St. Andrew of Caesarea says that the Lord offers this threat along with mercy or philanthropy because of the other excellent qualities of the bishop of Pergamos that we saw that he was fighting, he was despising Nicolaitans, he, he was a virtuous man. 
He was otherwise a good bishop with the exception of this minor oversight of allowing a few of his Christians to be influenced, though not the entire flock. Unfortunately, some of the Christians were taken in, in by this false teachings of Nicolaitanism. For us to understand this better, let's say that we have a great bishop or a priest. Father Athanasius says, let's say we have some very zealous, a great human being. He's always striving and struggling, always caring, so he will not overlook anything. In spite of his efforts, some of his parishioners become infected by the activities of some heretical groups. And he, Father Athanasius, he again mentions here Jehovah Witnesses, because in his time, uh, the Jehovah Witnesses in Greece were trying to uh, uh, do so-called, uh, quote-unquote, missionary work among the Greeks and uh, preying on the ignorant people who uh, were not very well educated in the theology of the church, were trying to seduce them into the, the, their heretical teachings. And he says, and may we have five or ten Jehovah Witnesses in his parish. We might think this is nothing major. However, the Lord insists that even these few should not exist in his church. We should tremble at the thought of what is happening in our days, the, uh, the way that we live today. But Athanasius says, what would the Lord say to us? However, the fact remains that the Lord is seeking the bishop's repentance. This shows that the bishop is guilty, regardless whether this is something very small, like a, a small prayer paragraph in the life of the church compared to the full scope of his work as a bishop. This may seem very minor by its standards. However, it is not of small consequence to allow a few of his Christians to fall victim to heresy. Let us remember the story of the parable when Christ says that the good shepherd will leave the 99 um, sheep and go for that one lost in order to bring it back to the flock. When a bishop or a priest neglects or does not make an effort to finish God's work, then God himself takes care over to see to it that this work is completed. By this, the Lord wants to point out to his workers, yes, I am giving you a job to do, but I will not abandon my church. I will help my church if you are neglectful. Something similar can take place with our children. If some parents do not provide for the spiritual development of their children, Christ will hold these parents accountable and Christ himself may take over the spiritual development of these children. We often see children of neglectful parents turning into wonderful people, wonderful Christians. Christ himself intervened in the spiritual development of these neglected children. However, this does not relieve the parents of their responsibility. As we have said before, our job as parents is not to raise geniuses or the next, uh, I don't know, uh, children who will be successful in their areas, whether it's athleticism, sports, or politics, or uh, financials, and or be the great merchants, and so forth, but rather to raise them to become holy. And the children do not do anything but imitate their parents. And if we as parents do not imitate Christ, then the children, by imitating us, will not imitate Christ. And in verse uh, 217, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who conquers, I will give some of the hidden mana, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone, which no one knows except him, him who receives it. Admittedly, the promises made here to one who wins uh, uh, seem odd. Let us look into the, uh, these promises of hidden mana and a name written specifically on a white stone. Today we'll explain what it means. The Lord uses two images. The first of the hidden mana, according to the verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 17. The second of a white stone with a name written on it. The image of mana, which is something edible, is used because... Uh, the enemies of the church of Pergamos, the Nicolaitans, influenced the Christians to eat food sacrificed to idols. In the desert, the Jews chose to eat the food sacrificed to idols from all the other food offered to them by Balak. 24,000 Jews were seduced to join Balak in his festivals. They ate meat sacrificed to the false god Balak, and by eating abominable, unclean foods, they polluted themselves. Then they also fall into fornication. This is all described in the, uh, <clears throat> the book of Numbers in the Old Testament. Therefore, Christ promises here that those in the church of Pergamos who refuse to eat from the polluted, uh, just a second, polluted sacrifice, uh, 
food offered by the Nicolaitans or who don't fall into their practices of fornication will be given the hidden manna to eat. But what is the hidden manna? It is uh, that which the Lord revealed in his gospel according to St. John, the miracle that fed the 5,000. The day after this miracle, some of these men from Capernaum drew near to the Lord and asked him to stay with them permanently for obvious reasons. Uh, they don't have to work anymore because he would uh, always bring them the bread and fish. The Lord told them, do not seek, in John 6, 27, do not seek and labor for the bread which perishes, but for the bread that endures forever. Of course, he was talking about his body or the Eucharist. And what is this bread? This man saw that he could produce free bread for everyone out of five loaves of bread and were naturally astonished. But now he tells them something new, not to seek the bread that perishes, but the bread that endures. Could it be that beyond his ability to create food or bread for them, he could also give them a certain food that would eliminate their hunger altogether? He mentioned something similar to the Samaritan woman. If you remember in John 4, 10 to 11, on the screen you have also the verse says, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him if he would have given you the living water. To their question about the food, or bread that endures, the Lord said, I'm the true manna. I'm the true food, the manna of heaven. Unlike the food that you, your forefathers ate in the desert and died, I'm the true manna. Anyone who eats my flesh, anyone who eats my body, the true manna will never die. So the old manna uh, of the, uh, the, the Jews ate in the desert was the prefigurement or prototype, if you will, the symbol of the new manna that is Jesus Christ. More specifically, it was the typology of the mystery of the divine Eucharist, which occurs in the consumption of the body and blood in the divine liturgy. Let's look now into the nature and the qualities of the old manna, the heavenly food of the desert, for some additional insights into the new manna or the holy Eucharist. But Athanasius says, what was the desert manna like? Solomon, in his book of wisdom, explains. By the way, I have to remind you that uh, these quotes that I have from the book of Solomon doesn't exist in the Protestant version of the Bible. They removed the wisdom of Solomon. It exists in the Septuagint, so I had to find the Septuagint version of this. <clears throat> Instead of these things, thou didst give thy people food of angels, and without their toil thou didst supply them from heaven with bread ready to eat, providing every pleasure and suited to every taste. For thy sustenance manifested thy sweetness towards thy children and the bread, ministering to the desire of the one who took it, was changed to suit everyone's liking. In other words, the very substance and great taste of manna was indicative of your sweetness, O Lord, towards your children. What was special about this manna was its very amazing quality to provide a different taste according to the person's desire. Even today, we cannot quite know what manna was not even the jews can explain what it was because after a couple of days that manna that was given to them from from heaven would be corruptible and they couldn't eat it anymore but, so that they would not grow attachment to it and that's a special thing we can talk about so what were you hungry for steak when you were eating this manna your desire for steak was satisfied were you hungry for beans when you were eating manna it would taste like beans does this surprise you some may wonder but these people were eating the same thing, the same manna for 40 years. However, this quality ceased to exist the moment they entertained the thought that they were repeatedly eating the same food. Uh, they basically lost the sight of God's miraculous providence. From that moment, the manna would lose its quality of changing into the desired taste for each person was hungry. At that point, the terrible phenomenon of the Hebrews approaching Moses and complaining that they were sick and tired of this empty bread occurred. In other words, the carnal Hebrews were bored with the tasteless heavenly manna. The hand of God felt terribly heavy against the people who, while eating the heavenly manna, began to look back and desire the onions, the garlic, the leeks of Egypt, and so on. These poor and pitiful human beings were tired of the heavenly food. Father Athanasius continues, they wanted, to, they, they wanted the earthly food of this world, not the food directly given to them by God. They could feel extremely well if they wanted to by looking to God alone. However, they did not want this godly 
discipline, if you will. This manna was a prefigurement and a typology of the one and exclusive real food for the human being, the body and blood of Christ. There is no other food that serves as food for immortality. Single, and we said this is the Eucharist, the single and exclusive food for mortality is the body and blood of Christ. The Lord commented that all those who ate that manna died. That was the typology of the prefigurement because those who eat the true manna will never die. They will live forever in the kingdom of God. And in John 6, 54, 56, we read the following. Christ says, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Isn't it amazing that this manna of the desert will fulfill the individual taste desired by each person? You must remember that the initial form of manna was like a pancake cooked with oil and honey. It looked like a, really like a pancake. Um, it looked like bread, but it tasted for every person uh, different. When we have pancakes for breakfast, we use syrup, honey, and butter or oil, and then we have the taste of oil or honey. Beyond this initial or basic taste, the manna would assume the different tastes as described by Solomon. You find it intriguing that this change could be different at all times. Let us look at some of the verses from the Song of Solomon. Solomon, let me just see if I have uh, here. Yes. As an apple tree among the tree of the wood, so is my beloved among young men. I sat down in his shade with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. His speech is most sweet and altogether desirable. This is in, uh, 2 and 3 and 516. In this love song, these are the words of the spotless bride, which are tribute to the relationship between God and more specifically with Christ, between Christ and the, the second person of the Holy Trinity. And his church, a relationship full of this strong, most powerful eros. Eros, as you know, is another word for love that we uh, uh, that the church uses for just, uh, among the words like storgi, philia, agapi, and so forth. Incidentally, do not let your mind stoop to anything carnal while reading the scriptural poetry. Sometimes people don't like to read the Song of Songs thinking that it's, uh, it's not appropriate to be part of the scripture, but it is because it's a poetry and it's also a wedding song. Because Protestants interprets attempt to drag this most spiritual eros, love lines, down to the carnal level. This eros or love of the Song of Songs has nothing to do with the erotica shops or, or of our filthy times, or God forbid, some, some uh, uh, abominable uh, understanding. Of it. it has nothing to do with carnal sexual relations. Divine eros is the highest level of pure burning love. St. Simon the New Theologian, for example, talks about it. St. Maximus the Confessor talks about it. Christianity is an eros love for Christ. What ails Christianity today is the loss of this eros love for God. Christianity without this flame, without this burning of the heart for Christ is a cold Christianity, a frozen Christianity. We live as Christians out of a sense of uh, out of sense for duty or because we have to or because it is a nice thing to do because, I don't know, it's a culture uh, uh, construct. We were baptized, so we might as well go to church, but we do not have this flame within us, this burning divine eros love. To give you an example, I remember a long time ago, someone asked the question, well, what do you mean to love God? How do we love God? And one of the things that came to me that something we, we a lot of the fathers are saying, and I, I just repeated what, what we read uh, by the fathers, from the fathers, is that imagine uh, or try to remember when you were first time in love, and, and whether it was in high school or whenever it was, and when, when we're in love, then everything ceases to exist. Uh, everything becomes not important. The only object of our interest is the person that we love. And this love can be <laughs> such a profound that person who is in love, he forgets to eat, he forgets to drink, he forgets to do anything else. The constant 
He has a constant remembrance of the loved ones. And this is exactly what you read in the book of Song of Songs. This is the eros we're talking about. It's not erotical in a sense, only sexual or, or sexual, but rather it's erotical in a sense, it's out of burning desire to be a longing, burning longing to be with the loved one, in this case, Christ. To quote again from the Song of Songs, this is in 2.3. As an apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among young men. With great delight, I sat in his shadow. And his speech is most sweet and he's altogether desirable. This is my beloved. These lines represent the Eros love relationship between the soul and the bridegroom or Christ. At the same time, these verses also represent the Eros love relationship between the church and Christ. His, uh, again, uh, in the quotations, his fruit was sweet to my taste. His mouth is most sweet. He's altogether full of desire. He's desire in its entirety, full of desire. You see here how that we have a faithful of Eroslav, that very thing that we lack in practice. But Athanasia says, Christians today have lost this burning love for the bridegroom. What Solomon says about the manna of the desert you're all sweet, you're all desire, shows that what, has, what, what, what was eaten in the desert was the Lord's typology, the prefigurement of the true manna. The Lord himself now interprets this typology in his Gospels. He says, I am the true manna. Can you imagine how awesome that is? It is important to remember that anyone who ate this manna had the specific taste that his heart desired. To those who eat like steak, it tasted like meat. To those who eat sweets, it tasted like sweet and so forth. That was the miracle of eating the manna, because it came from heaven. In a similar way, he who partakes of the body and blood of Christ receives whatever charisma, whatever gift, his heart's desires. Lord, grant me patience. Lord, give me peace. Lord, give me joy. Lord, give me wisdom. Lord, all of these gifts are given. There is one prayer in the priest. If you remember, that's why I try to read the prayers out loud here in our prayers so that we can understand the liturgy. But one prayer during the liturgy, the priest says, and Lord, let these mysteries, these gifts, the, referring to the Eucharist, the body and blood of Christ, be distributed to everyone according to his needs. Sail with those who sail, we'll travel with those who travel, be a physician to our souls and bodies and so on and so forth. In the, in the liturgy, and basic, they're going to really go in even more deeper, explaining that, we all who come to church, we all come from different angles, from different reasons. For example, someone has come to church, he was just diagnosed with cancer, and he needs physical healing and comfort. Someone is going through a rough patch in his marital relationship with his wife. Someone has come because uh, his children disappointed him with something that they did or so forth. There was a fight. Someone came here because he uh, needs a, a profound prayer. Someone came because he was moved by repentance. Someone came because he fell into what we call spiritual despair, so he needs healing. We all come for different reasons, but we all receive the same Eucharist, the same Christ. And in return, guys, is, Christ is giving us back to us in a different way. That is why the Eucharist is the true manna. I, I hope it uh, makes sense to, uh, to what I'm saying, because this is what Father Athanasius is referring to. This is what uh, the typology of the manna of the Old Testament now becomes the true fulfillment in the Eucharist that we have in the liturgy. I am the true manna, says Christ. Receive these gifts while partaking of the body and blood of Christ, which uh, are his different tastes. Everyone. Uh, who communes, partakes of the same thing. All the faithful share the common cup and everyone receives the gifts that he desires, the ones he prayerfully asks God to grant him. The other image, the other image uh, of the white stone comes from the voting stones used by the, both by the ancient Greeks and the people during the time of Christ. Um, this uh, light porous and almost weightless pumice stone can be seen to this day floating on the Mediterranean Sea following the movements of the breaking waves. Eventually, this white stone ends up on the shore and it's called psifida. I, I wrote you the, uh, the Greek version, psifida, because of the psi sound uh, that it makes uh, as the water carry. 
since the Psyphida stone was used as a voting ballot, the Greek world, the Greek word for vote is psyphos. Psyphizome in Greek means we're voting, we're going for election, derived from the Psyphida stone. The name of the candidate was written on such white stones, and the Lord uses the image of this voting procedure to say to him who will win regarding the content mentioned in the epistle to him who will not be influenced by the hateful deeds of the Nicolaitans, their method and their actions, that he will give him a white stone. This is in 2.17. This is the meaning of the white stone. The, vi the, the, the white voting stone was not only used in the elections of the political leaders of the ancient Greek nations, but in, the, in its court system as well. The white stones were used for the uh, acquittal of defendants. The members of the jury would cast white stones if they, uh, they thought the defendant was innocent and so on. Defendant stone or uh, the diff a different stone or let's say black stone was used to, um, uh, to indict um, that he was guilty, the person they were judging. So you may have heard the story about Aristides, but Athanasius says the righteous Aristides, who had heard the reputation of being the most righteous and fair ruler in Athens. At some point, his actions rubbed the Athenians the wrong way and he found himself in court. If he was found guilty, he would lose his governing status and he would be exiled. As he was walking about Athens, an older citizen approached him and, without knowing who he was, asked him for his assistance. Sir, would you please write on my stone exile Aristides? And Aristides asked him, excuse me, sir, but do you know anything about this man? Do you know uh, this Aristides fellow? He had uh, done anything to you? No, I don't know the man, but I'm getting tired of hearing everyone call him righteous. Very well, then. Aristides obeyed the wishes of this illiterate Athenian without revealing his identity. Aristides, the great man of Athens, was exiled by the court system of the city. Thus, the stone would serve for either the acquittal or the sentencing of the person in question. So here, when the Lord says, I will give him a white stone, um, he means that this man will not go through judgment. St. John states very beautifully in his gospel, and this is in John 5, 24. He says, Amen, amen, or most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. The death the Lord refers to is what we call biological death. One will pass over from death to life. He will not undergo judgment. This is the meaning of the white stone. He who gets this white stone is acquitted. We often hear that we all win. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we often hear that, we will, uh, that all will be judged for our works. Will the saints be judged as well? No. The saints will not be judged because they pass over from this earthly death into everlasting life without judgment. Remember in the liturgy we pray. And, and give us boldness or with boldness to call upon you, our Father. And then we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. To acquire boldness in front of God means to defeat death, to receive the white stone. There is no need for judgment if we have acquired the Holy Spirit. If we have entered into theosis, becoming one with God. Upon this white stone, a sort of passport that exonerates one from judgment. There is a new name as well. As well. What is this new name? That in, in, writes in the, in the book of Revelation, it's unknown. Only the one, Father Athanasius says, only the one who received this white stone knows the new name. St. Andrew of Caesarea and St. Arethas, the both authorities of the interpretation of the book of um, Revelation, both say this new name cannot be revealed in this present life. <clears throat> only um, the saints will receive this name. And who are the saints? Everyone who is in the Eucharist, everyone who meets each other in the chalice. That's why we have the Holy of Holies or the Holy One. Holy gifts are the Holy Ones. When the priest says he gives in the name of the, everyone who is present in the church, the, the triumphant church in the heavens, but also the militant church, which is us, who we'll still live in our biological life here. How is it possible to reveal incorruptible, uncreated things in a corruptible world? Father Athanasius says. For this reason, it remains a mystery to the, of the incorruptible world. Only the one who, received this, who receives this white stone knows this. The epistle to the Bishop of Pergamos ends with these two promises to the one who overcomes, the one, the one who endures. 
that the Lord will give him to eat from the hidden manna. We said the hidden manna is the prototype of the, uh, in the Old Testament, is now Christ, the Eucharist, Christ himself. And that the Lord will give him a white stone with a new name. Let's say new identity. Uh, 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 to become a citizen, a passport, if you will, into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, St. Paisios of Mount Athos, he used to say, what do we do in this life? Fasting, prayer, giving alms, becoming, uh, purifying ourselves from, from passions and from sins, and purifying our hearts, enlightening ourselves with the, with the knowledge of truth, with Christ, and uniting ourselves with God. With those is basically his acquirement of the papyrology, if you will, passport, the green card, whatever you want to call it, for the citizenship of the kingdom of heaven. Now, with the help of God, we enter the fourth epistle by St. John that was sent to the Bishop of Theatira. And uh, this is something that uh, we'll, we'll try to cover now. And to the angel of the church of Theatira, right in 218, we continue. Theatira lies southeast of the city of Pergamos here. I can southeast. You see, uh, we talked about Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, and now we go to Theatira, then Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. It was a Lydian city built by Seleucus the first. It was the most insignificant of the seven cities that received the epistle from the Lord. This city housed industrial personnel and merchants. It was an industrial city, a city of commerce. It did not have the same luminosity of a city like Ephesus, Mino, Pergamos, which had great libraries and famous temples with spiritual and civic uh, centers. It was a small and insignificant city. However, the Lord sent the longest of all seven epistles to this small and unimportant city. So let us now just uh, <coughs> try to, to read this. Into the angel of the church of Theatira, write the words of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patience and yours. And yet your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and beguiling my servants to practice immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her doings, and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches shall know that I am he who... Uh, he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you as your works deserve. But to the rest of you in Theatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay upon you any other burden, only hold fast what you have until I come. He who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, I will give him power over the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received power from my father and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. This is from chapter 2, verse 18 to 29. But Athanasius says, as you remember from the previous verses, the feet of the Lord appearing in the initial version, vision were extremely bright. They were like fine glowing brass, a glowing mixture of gold and silver, if you remember when we talked about it. Two different elements are central in the introductionary lines of this epistle. The first is taken from the initial vision during which the Lord appeared directly before his mesmerized disciple in Patmos, to St. John, the theologian who sees in front of him Christ now, but, but Christ in glory, not the humble Christ that he used to see him uh, in his earthly life. He uh, stays in this position as he dictates to St. John to record this epistle. In this vision, his eyes are like a flame of fire. These eyes represent the ability of the Lord to penetrate, to see through the deep things of Satan, a matter that he will address in this epistle. St. John also refers to his feet, which shows that he's not, of, uh, not one who will maintain a passive position towards this knowledge and verification of the deep things of Satan, but will crush his 
adversaries with his brass feet. The other element of this epistle is the self-proclamation of Jesus as the Son of God. Uh, this title is messianic and corresponds fully with the content of the second psalm, uh, the verse 8 and 9, where the Messiah has authority over the nations and crushes the adversaries. He crushes them with an iron rod in the same way a potter crushes pieces of pottery, like vases, crocs, and urns. Or the way one might use a sledgehammer and shatter discarded clay utensils. With the same ease, the Lord will crush the deep things of Satan. It is as if he said to the bishop, although the deep things of Satan surround you, don't be afraid. I see them. You don't see them. How can you see them? They're hidden. They're covered with, with a veil. These deep things of Satan are locked away. You cannot see them. The Lord indicates that he can see them by saying, do not be afraid. I will crush and abolish all of these things. The interpretation of the second psalm is magnificent. But Athanasius says this remarkable interpretation as messianic comes from the Lord because it concerns himself. So naturally, he gives us this second psalm in its full, in its full dimension. The Jews recognize and accept that this is a messianic psalm, even though these piteous people do not accept the person of Jesus Christ. What a pity. After the introduction or opening lines of this epistle, we move into the main topic. In 2.19, he says, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your later works exceed the first. Very nice, comforting and praising words indeed. This is this, I know from God, I know your works. So he starts with the praise. Yet if you remember, in the epistle of the bishop of Ephesus, he wrote, you left your first love. He exactly told him what he was missing. Here, to the bishop of Theodore, he writes the opposite. And your last works exceed the first. The last works of the bishop of Ephesus were weak. While the opposite is true for the bishop of Theatira, his last works were more substantial. They were increasing. We observe here two diametrically opposed poles with a common central balancing point. This is just like the pole of the um, algebraic numbers where we have the neutral point zero and the numbers can move in a positive or negative direction. Zero designates our position concerning our willingness and motivation as we begin to live a spiritual life. But Athanasius says, at certain times we descend, we go below our starting point. We go below zero. We hear this depressing and disheartening phrase that the Lord has told to the Bishop of Ephesus. You have left your first love. At other times we ascend and climb above the initial starting point. In going up, we hear the words of praise which the Lord says to the Bishop of Theatira, your last works exceed the first. These two points represent the different positions or levels of the faithful in the church. And obviously, there is a great variety of these positions, whether we talk about a person or a church community. We need to often undergo an occasional self-examination, whether examining ourselves as individuals or as communities, and ask if we're uh, gaining ground. Asking ourselves, am I progressing towards holiness or I'm losing ground? The fact is that it is impossible for anyone to stand still and continue to stay in the initial level. In other words, we, if you remember, we've talked before many times that we cannot have something that we call in the church a spiritual status quo. There is no such thing. Uh, uh, this is actually a very dangerous state when people think they're satisfied with their state spiritual life. Okay, I go to church, I light candles, I give donations, I help, uh, I, I do this certain things. And now in return, I want from God this, this, and this, and this. And they kind of think that they have fulfilled certain uh, or accomplish certain checklist, and this status quo is basically a demonic deception and can lead us into a, a delusion that we're somehow okay, and we don't make any efforts to make uh, anything more than this. On a contrary, true uh, a signs or signals, if you will, a diagnosis of a true spiritual life, a healthy spiritual life, is that we are sensing more and more unsettledness. The closer we get to God. To his holiness, the more we see our iniquities, the more we see our flaws, the more we see our passions, those that we know of and those we don't know that we have, but can actually come up later in life. And that is why uh, even King David in one of the Psalms, he says, I feel, uh, I see myself as a beast in front of you, O Lord. I can see even my insights in front of you. It, 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 it's like approaching towards the sun 
and the sun is so powerful with its light and warmth that penetrates our body. And we can even see it on sides, like in a, um, like an X-ray, if you will. Even though in some things, Father Atanasius says we could talk about relative immobility. In reality, this is never the case. Man's life is dynamic, whether he likes it or not. We cannot say this that it never changes. Consider a body temperature, for instance. Is it possible for a temperature to stay at 98.6 degrees without the slightest fluctuation? Since human beings are living organisms, their body temperature will always fluctuate. So my friends, there is not even one of our activities or energies that will remain stable or at the initial state or at a particular level. Therefore, the person who says that he has reached a certain level and here he will stop, does not stop. In reality, he will begin to ascend or descend. There is no status quo, as we said. Actually, he will descend if he says that this is a comfortable place to stop. Uh, the, the state of status quo, spiritual status quo, actually is an is a unnoticed, slow decay, slow descending. This is why the best method, for Atanasius says, of spiritual preservation, and please try to always remember this, is to keep ascending. You want to keep your orthodox spirituality, then keep climbing. If you say, I have advanced enough, I feel content with my progress, so I will take a spiritual sabbatical, if you will, then you are already on a dangerous downslide if you persist in this thing. To, to uh, acquire a mindset that somehow uh, I'm okay, I'm good, I don't need anything more, this is, this is uh, I, I'm self-sufficient, I, I feel great. But Athanasius says, what I just mentioned holds true in all, aspe all aspects of our life and not only in our spirituality, in, uh, in all matters of life, in our education, in our finances. If we want to maintain our position, then we keep advancing and keep climbing. For this reason, it is necessary to have a constant spiritual uh, temperature check to observe our spiritual th thermometer and to continue to Repraise our spiritual life. He who begins to ascend towards holiness at some point will discover that he has reached a critical state. At this point, he needs to pay extra attention and be especially careful once he makes up his mind to repent and to live a spiritual life. So he is all set and makes an effort to attend church, confess regularly, focus on spiritual matters, begin to know the Jesus Christ and participates in the mysteries of the church. Let me just check in the chat. Yeah, Mark says, complacency is essentially the beginning of the hardening of the conscious, which left unchanged will lead us ultimately into spiritual darkness. Exactly, Mark. Exactly. That's, that's, that's the whole thing. We, I, I just used the word status quo, spiritual status quo, but that's exactly when we think we're, actually the devil helps us a lot about this and our pride uh, when we ourselves, how many times we hear people say, especially the old people, well, I'm a good man, I'm a good woman, I've never done anything wrong. Especially when I was a young priest, the old babushkas will come to me, oh, I don't have anything to confess, Father, I've never killed anyone. That's a Serbian thing. Like, you know, like, you know, like we have to kill someone in order to confess sins. Oh, I've never done anything wrong. And then I would ask him three questions that my spiritual father asked me to ask them. And they would always fail on those. They would all. Well, I would ask them, the first question was, have you ever you know, cheated on your husband. Oh, oh, they would say, well, that was long, 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 long time ago and it happened and I didn't meant it and whatever. And I would ask them, have we ever uh, committed abortion? And because we lived in communism, a lot of women were, were falling into that sin. Yes, they would say, but they forgot about that sin. Or if in the third question, I would ask them, have we ever went, you know, to a sorcerer, you know, like those, not the Ouija boards, but those women who are allegedly are, during people like magicians, just like the woman Jezebel will talk about a little bit today. Yes, they would do that as well, or watch some magical coffee and whatever. So, meaning that uh, they, they, they acquire this mentality, that everything is okay. When you think that you're good, that's, that's actually when you fall. Sometimes, however, we talk about the mysteries of the church in the legalistic way, for Athanasius says, as if they are about the fulfillment of a certain duty. The mysteries are not something that we must go out of a sense of duty, there are paths that lead to life. There are tunnels or channels that lead us to life, to God. So when you begin to climb spiritually, at some point you will reach a critical point and have the feeling that you cannot climb anymore because you are tired. This is a crisis that we all encounter along the way. It's normal. 
Everyone goes through this. Those that set out to live a spiritual life go on and on and on, and then at some point become afraid. They panic. At times, parents panic for their children. They wonder what is going to happen to their child. How far does he need to go? So many times, because the, uh, because the parents cannot deal with this anxiety, they force the children to stop. They tell their child, that's enough. Do not go any further. We need to understand that when we come to the point of panic or exhaustion, we have reached the critical plateau. Another example of this is when we overeat and our stomach has great difficulty dealing with its content. Then we say that the stomach is undergoing a crisis. Now, which way is the crisis going to go? The stomach can vomit the contents or a heart can attack or, or a heart attack can keep the stomach from functioning. People do occasionally die from overeating. Alternatively, the stomach may manage to digest and it can overcome this crisis. If Father Athanasius gives us another example, he says, let's consider an even greater example in the area of supersonics. When a jet takes off and its speeds increases, the behavior of the air changes as the plane goes faster and faster. The air increasingly becomes a solid mass. At a certain point, as the speed of the plane increases and comes close to the speed of sound, the air takes the dimension of a solid material and the jet feels like it's cutting through a mountain. The jet feels almost ready to fall apart because the air acts like a solid mass. If the jet succeeds in crossing this critical point called the sound barrier, the airplane starts gliding very smoothly. Not only does it escape danger, but it becomes supersonic. Once it goes beyond the sound barrier, it flies very comfortably as though the air no longer exists. This very thing happens in the orthodox spiritual life. The moment you have reached this critical point, you will succeed if you don't lose heart. Meaning, in other words, to paraphrase what just the example of Father Athanasius says, we need to become fearless. If we stand on a cliff and underneath is the ocean, in only a way to learn how to swim, to taste the water, to taste and experience the beauty of, and, or the adventure of swimming, is to jump, not to stay and intellectualize about jumping, about the water, whether it's wet, whether it's cold, whether it's hot, whether it's this and that, salty or sweet and so forth. But rather jump and see it for yourself. Go into the adventure. Don't, uh, don't just over, overthink over the cliff. It is a matter of losing heart. Father Athanasius says, please understand this. The word of God speaks about this in the Revelation. This is in 21.8. Uh, this is, of course, towards the end of the verse. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the polluted, as for murderers, fornicators, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their lot shall be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. But if you do not cower, if cave, we can use the word, if you do not give up from exhaustion and succeed in passing this barrier, in other words, go spiritually supersonic, then the spiritual life that awaits you is wonderful. It feels so great and so natural that you would not consider living in any other way. It feels like it is in your blood, like something woven into your entire existence. Father Athanasius says, if you happen to meet a very spiritual person, an ascetic, he will act surprised if you tell him that you cannot reach that sort of spirituality, that you cannot possibly reach his level. He will say, how can you say this? It's so easy. It's not hard at all. It feels like the easiest thing for him because he went beyond the critical point. And now that he's beyond that point, the life of the spirit is for him something very natural and effortless. This precisely meaning in the footnote says, of the words of Christ, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's actually basically in other words to explain a little bit more about this. It is the, the social construct, the, the pollution of, of the ideas and intellectualization of the faith, of overburdening ourselves with, with demonic knowledge, half truths, bombarded constantly, uh, consciously and subconsciously with, with garbage that prevents us to go supersonic in a spiritual life, to give ourselves in, to become children, to become um, free from the burden and the attachments that we have into this world. 
Father Athanasius says, there is a second consideration here. When we overcome or go beyond this critical point, we realize that this can be accomplished in every area of self-control, such as food, sex, and all aspects of life. When we overcome these obstacles, then life becomes like a dream. None of the above elements are real consideration. It feels that they no longer exist. Subsequently, you live in the deep peace of God. What is the thing that we call peace anyway? Precisely this, that once the passions subside after breaking through this critical barrier, one possesses the gift of peace, peace of mind, peace of compassion, a lasting peace. And if you read, for example, St. Joseph the Hisichast, the life of St. Mary of Egypt that we just recently uh, celebrate and this week is dedicated to her, that one of the first things that they started when they entered into the solitude, fighting their, themselves, fighting the demons, fighting the passions, fighting the fleshness of, of, of their being, was, let's say, the, the demon of fornication, the sexual desires. And they became passionless, of course, by the help of God and with, by the grace of God, in a few years. And then the rest of the life they had was much different than what they had in the beginning. But at the very beginning, once when we go... Uh, through this phase, we uh, can <laughs> we 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 suffer a lot from the demonic scares that oh no that's not possible you cannot possibly do that you're not normal that's not uh, easy to do and so forth. Let me remind you that Father Nasius is a monk. Um, Saint uh, Mary of Egypt was a nun. She was a, she lived in a, she was a hermit. Uh, Saint Isaac is We're going to come to him a little bit also. These are the people who, as Christ describes in the gospel, they are those who are circumcised in their heart to, to live like that, to be like eunuchs, to be like uh, without the need to follow these passions, or they easily overcome them because they don't allow the world to influence them, pollute them in order to, to follow this. So Saint Isaac the Syrian writes about an ascetic having taken 30 years to defeat some specific tempting thoughts. I'll add here, St. Joseph the Hesychat has his best friend. You know who his best friend was? It was his stick. He would hit himself for eight years in order to fight this passion. And finally, when this passion uh, released him, I'll paraphrase what he says, but basically he says, even if a naked woman entered my cell, I would see her as my sister and I would cover her with my rasa because he became passionless, free from, from burden of that sin. And then he lived many, many years afterwards dealing with other stuff, but not with those passions. Meaning that we can all go spiritually supersonic, to, 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 paraphrase, to paraphrase. 30 years, after, tw after 20 years, he still had no assurance of any possible progress. This is uh, according to Saint uh, Isaac the Syrian about this ascetic he was describing. Do you understand this? We all need to grasp this, Father Athanasius says. 20 years went by with no answer. He was fighting this passion. Around the 25th year, he began to feel some progress. Then after a few more years, after 30 years of battle, he reached peace of thoughts. He finally broke through the critical barrier. You may be surprised and wonder at it having taken so much years, but this is precisely why we were given this life. The question is not to make babies or not, to possess homes or apartments or not, to amass money or not. Life was given to us precisely for this reason, to succeed in passing this critical plateau. It sounds a bit scary, but this is the essence of Orthodox spirituality. Father Tanasio says, I cannot present anything different to you. I struggle alongside you and you struggle alongside me. We have not reached this level. We have a long way to go. Nevertheless, this is what the Orthodox spirituality. Remember this, because those who speak to you about something very easy and effortless are more likely offering you something foreign and strange to true Orthodox spirituality. I don't know. The first one that comes to mind is that Joe Olstein and or, or the so-called motivational speakers who can say all this, or, or the, the, the internet or the YouTube is full with those motivational speakers who say these wisdoms and whatever. Uh, well, the Orthodox says, no, we have to spit blood in order to receive the Holy Spirit. But yes, it is possible. It is true we can go past this period. A third point for Athanasius is to consider is that the one that reaches this level never considers his accomplishment as holiness. 
Yeah, as a, 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 an opposite, he considers himself a greater sinner. Others may be fascinated, but he looks at his lifestyle as something very common and insignificant. He feels that as he has already achieved this level, it is really nothing special. He looks at his lowly position and turns his eyes towards conquering higher levels of holiness. Let's see. Um, yeah. We'll finish very, uh, very soon. Most of your works are good, the Lord tells the Bishop of Theatre. I know that your last works are better than the, the first. I have a few things against you. However, he says Christ into this, uh, to the Bishop of Theatre. What are these few things that the Lord has against the Bishop of Theatre? Although everything seems well, there are some imperfections. I had told you earlier that this gives us hope because we too are forced to look at our weaknesses. You allow that woman Jezebel, I'm quoting now, you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and eat food sacrificed to idols. You allow the woman, he says to the bishop, and according to another text, your woman or your wife, but we do not find this to be the case with the most texts. So that's an interesting point Father Francis is posing. Most ancient manuscripts record that woman, with the exception of the Alexandrian text and a few others that write your woman to the bishop, he says. You allow Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and deceive my servants. She deceives them into committing sexual immorality and into eating food sacrifice to idols. As you can see here, we have a new threat plaguing the church of Theatira, which the Lord finds necessary to address and reprove. Who was Jezebel? Obviously, she was a historical person, and this woman was a member of the local church. As such, she was a participant in the holy mysteries and portrayed herself not only as a Christian, but also as a prophetess. She considered herself a prophetess, but in fact, she was a false prophetess, and the Lord characterizes her as such. This very letter to the church of Theatira, he calls her Jezebel. However, in order to understand the nature of this woman and the reason he calls her Jezebel, we need to look at an old story, as we did in our recent talk about Balaam and Balak, the topology of the Nicolaites. So let me just explain that uh, this uh, woman who calls herself a prophetess, it's not a surprising, uh, a lot of women who call themselves Christians, especially in the Balkans, influenced by paganism or some uh, superstition, Islam that was there for five centuries, they have even icons when, when they try to so-called, quote-unquote, read prayers to people. But actually what they do is demonic uh, uh, work. Here, this woman is associated with sexual immorality and foods sacrificed to, sacrificed to idols, even though the reference seems to be metaphorical and not literal. But Athanasius says it could be literal as well, but it's most likely metaphorical. In other words, the sexual immorality and the things sacrificed to idols have an allegorical sense. In the Old Testament, the words fornication and adultery are very common. And here the Lord speaks about adultery. Because uh, worshipping idols is adultery. You are adultering against your God. You're basically faring or praying to other gods, actually demons. And uh, 2.23, and the Lord... And I will kill her children. I, I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am He who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give each one of you according to your works. From this is uh, from this is evident that what is referred to is not natural physical fornication, but spiritual or metaphorical. In essence, rebellion against the true God. However. This rebellion is not easily recognized, and it has to do with the spirit of delusion, or prelis. This is significant because the woman, as a member of the church, was maliciously deceiving the others. It seems if we take the references to fornication and food sacrifice to idols literally, that she was involved in a Gnostic heresy, probably. However, I believe, Father Athanasius says, they are rather meant metaphorically to point out the rebellion of this spirit of delusion. In both cases, it has the same meaning. Literal or metaphorical. The Lord uh, reveals this dangerous woman, this new Jezebel, a name the Lord uses metaphorically to reprove this woman of the church of Theatira. We are all aware that the original Jezebel was a princess of Phoenician birth who was married to Ahab, the Israelite king of the northern kingdoms, of, of the Israel, it's called. 
Those are the 10 tribes who were north from Judea and the Benjamin tribe. She was a terrible, demonic woman. She had a very controlling nature and managed to control her husband to the extent that she governed the country rather than him. She also introduced idolatry to Israel as the Phoenician gods were idols. She was a horrifying woman who persecuted those who worshipped the true God of Israel as well as the prophet Elijah with a demonized passion. She introduced the worship of Baal and was instrumental in getting the Israel to commit sexual immorality and eat food, food sacrifice to idols. She killed the prophets of God, especially a certain class called the sons of the prophets, the, uh, and fervently sought the execution of prophet Elijah. If you read the, the book of Kings, you will, uh, she, and here I have in the Old Testament, all the references. She married Ahab. She killed in the first Kings 18, four, she knew God's prophets. She ordered Naboth's dead, practiced witchcraft, dogs, and ate her body and left bones. This is 2 Kings 9, 3. And the New Testament is in the Revelation in 2021, 20, well, chapter 2 is verse where we are talking now. A common characteristic of demonized people is that they will stop at nothing to achieve their goals. Up to that point, the southern kingdom had maintained its faith to the true God. Jezebel succeeded through political manipulation to make her daughter the wife of the prince and heir of the southern kingdom. This evil woman was a carbon copy of her evil mother. She introduced idolatry to the southern kingdom, and the result was that the future kings competed with the kings of the north in idolatry and sin. In the end, God punished both kingdoms. The, the kingdom of Israel, Israel was divided in two kings. The northern part we're talking about are the ten tribes. And the, the south part were Jerusalem, because it was surrounded with the Judean desert, there were only the Judean, the Judah tribe, and the Benjamin tribe. And they, that's why they had less influence by the local cultures, while the northern uh, ten tribes were easily being influenced because they were surrounded with Assyrian, Babylonian, Phoenician, and many other cultures and, and um, political influences and, and of sorts. The Assyrians enslaved the northern kingdom, and shortly afterwards, the Babylonians took the southern kingdom captive. You see, Father Athanasius said, what these two women accomplished, this mother and daughter, caused the destruction of entire nation of God through their fornications. Fornications in quotations, because fornication doesn't necessarily mean just the tangible sexual manifestation, but fornication, the diversion from God, idolatry, basically. A uh, spiritual delusion. Thus, in the revelation, the Lord says to the Bishop of Theatre, you have this woman, Jezebel, who leads my people astray, meaning that she appears as one coming to destroy the people of God, the people of the Church of Theatre. The Lord was obviously displeased by the fact that the Bishop of uh, Theatre was not distancing her from the, from the Church. He was allowing her in a way. He was tolerating, uh, tolerating her. Bishop Antimus, an 18th century Bishop of Jerusalem writes of the Bishop of Theatira. He was not neglecting her fresh Christian identity, but, but was addressing her as a Christian. And by this name, she was able to lead the servants of God astray and make them subject to her delusions, committing sexual immorality and eating foods they sacrificed to idols. In other words, the mistake of the bishop was that he did not cut her off from the flock. He failed to warn the flock to announce to them that this woman was not Christian. As long as she was calling herself a Christian, she could easily delude Christians in the church. From this point, we can see that sexual immorality and sacrifice to have a metaphorical meaning also. If she had carried an entire stone pit in the front of the church, the bishop and the Christians would certainly have awakened. These were fervent Christians, and they would certainly not eat food sacrificed to us. But metaphorically, she was able to deceive them. However, it seemed that this woman stayed in Theatira and became the forerunner of Montanism. That's a heresy that I don't know if we ever talked about that, but maybe we can. A few years later, the city was recorded the rise of someone called Montanus. Montanus was a heretic who believed and thought that he was the incarnation of the Holy Spirit. He thought that Jesus Christ was the incarnation of the Word of God, the lowest, and that he, Montanus, was the incarnation of the Holy Spirit. Of course, a deep, deep delusion spiritual. Realist. He had two women who claimed that they were prophetess, prophesizing through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and that they had multiple revelations and visions. The Lord reveals that they were, of course, false prophetess, just as he reveals that um, the false prophetess in this epistle of uh, the, the so-called Jezebel. This Jezebel of Theatira was a false prophetess and the spiritual predecessor of the Montanists. This heresy upholds extreme distance, and the Montanists were condemned, of course, by the church. 
This heresy upholds extreme discipline, extreme self-control. Montanism thought that conjugal uh, relations in marriage pollute uh, the spouses. Montanism spread throughout the entire Mediterranean. There was a certain charm to it because it thought something were, were very austere, which nevertheless was condemned by the church. Therefore, Mont uh, Montanus is the first wild weed that sprouted from this prophetess, this woman who coexisted in the midst of the church of Theatira. However, the same Jezebels is also the forerunner of all those who to this day claim that they can invoke the Holy Spirit, perform miracles on television or internet or wherever you want, speak in tongues, so-called, at will, and perform many, quote-unquote, signs and wonders. That is why the book of Revelation is very important to read because we see that not, there's nothing new under the sun and that what Christ is uh, writing to the church of Ephesus, Smyrna, Theatira, Pergamos, and, and later on to the Laodicean and the other churches is relevant to this day uh, to all of us in order to read the signs of time since the devil is not very creative when it comes to his delusions but always comes back to the old ways of uh, deceiving. Anyway, um, that will be all for today because we're uh, beyond our time. It's 7.15 already. So we want to uh, pause here. If you have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to do so. I like Mark said, again, I'll, uh, I'll repeat what he says. Complacency is essentially the beginning of the hardening of the conscious, which left unchanged will lead us ultimately into spiritual darkness. I don't know, Mark, if is this your quote or maybe you found it somewhere from uh, or someone else. Uh, it's a very, very good quote because it's very true. Actually, very eloquently put because it summarizes uh, what we talk when we talk about the so-called spiritual quo, quo uh, uh, spiritual status quo. Uh, yes, since this is all for, uh, for now, uh, just to let you know that... Uh, we're going to take a break from the Bible studies for the next uh, three, four weeks, maybe, because uh, we have a lot of events coming up. Of course, Passion Week, then the Bride Week, then our Slavis, and then we want to take a break a week of that from after that, because we have to finish some work around the parish. We have other events happening. But God willing, in, in three weeks from, from now, we'll, we'll continue on a regular time on Tuesday and Wednesday with Father Matthew. So uh, we, we're going to pause for, for now. If you have any questions, of course, uh, let me know. To remind you tomorrow, yeah, go ahead, Mark, unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you, Father. Um, just, just for clarity, so um, did, did, was the understanding that this Jezebel figure in Thyatira, Tira, uh, she, it was more symbolic than actually physical Both. okay Both. that's what i thought she was a real a historical person she was a real historical person but he refers to the metaphorical explanation because he comes back for that analysis he's giving us the example from the old testament jezebel that this is a new jezebel and she's basically the same spirit uh, demonic spirit she was pretending that she was a christian just like the jezebel of the old testament became even a queen to an israeli king and uh, she was Jewish in a way, but she was practicing idol worshiping and persecuted the prophets, deluding whole nation, starting with the king. In the same way, Jezebel, by being tolerated in the church, this Jezebel, also ha having the name Jezebel, is doing basically the same thing, deluding the Christians in the church by uh, also idolatry, by sprouting out new uh, teachings that were delusional. So both. It's, it's literal, it's, it's a historical specific person, and it's also, uh, her behavior is a metaphor because it reminds, Christ uses the old Jezebel to remind him as well, but the old Jezebel in the Old Testament, what she did, that this is the same person. Of course, not biologically the same, but rather the same spirit behind her. I okay. hope it yeah. makes sense. Yeah, it Go. does. I, I'm just thinking just a, a quick quick comment on that is, Oftentimes, uh, we see, I'll say, friends of the faith where they 
um, where they'll say, well, it's okay to dabble a little bit of numerology because it's all of God, because God created everything. And, and you realize it's just a, it, no. it's dangerous because no. then you can start chasing those things and uh, yeah. you'll, you'll head down that dark path. Yeah. Uh, yes, that, that's very true. No numerology, no necromancy, no any of those nonsense Ouija boards and whatever. Well, God created everything. Well, it, it, those people can also say, which is a typical heresy, God is also creator of the evil. You know? Because right. if he created everything, the logic says that, well, if there is evil, that he's also creator of this. So God, so God is also good, but also he's evil. It's a very ancient heresy. Actually, the old accusation of Lucifer against God as a tyrant but when it comes to uh, when it comes to that we need to be careful with those things because uh, I, I will give you uh, because now we're in the middle of the great land and we're not going to see each other on the bible studies uh, for like a few weeks uh, something that i learned a long time ago from my spiritual father about this uh, when when he he told me something very important he said when we are not able to consult with our spiritual father, to talk to him about, let's say, we have a problem. We want to do something, and when you need his advice, his perspective, maybe, what is the is this uh, will be pleasing to God or not, and so forth. When we don't have that opportunity to do, which can very often happen, especially if we are distant from, from our spiritual father or from our parish priest and so forth. He says, listen to the whisper of the Holy Spirit. And what is the whisper of the Holy Spirit? It's basically the whisper of our conscience, our conscience. Meaning, in other words, any time when we intend to do something and we feel uneasy about it, even though that the, the deed, the, the thing that we want to do is logical, it's good, maybe it will benefit, but inside of us, something is breaking, something is kind of making us, is evicting the inner peace, to use other term. Don't do that. Listen to your conscience. Every time when you want to do something and you're in peace with it, it brings you spiritual comfort, brings you humility, uh, uh, activates the attributes of or the virtues of, of patience, of repentance, of humility, then go and do that. So this is the, the advice that we can use on a practical level every day. Let's say, I have a conversation with you and, and uh, we talk and I say something that was on spot. It was correct. It was honest. It was truth. But maybe I should have not said it in that way or maybe somehow in my, I feel uneasy. Now I feel I need to confess because maybe I have offended my brother or my sister. Maybe I have done something that I didn't. So either I can at least confess and apologize and so forth. Uh, so it's better to sometimes examine our conscience and uh, acquire the, the peace. The peace uh, uh, of the heart is St. Tadeus of Vitovnitz, a Serbian saint, the one, the book probably all read, Our Thoughts Determine Our Life. He also said, defend your peace, inner peace with everything you have. In other words, um, if let's say certain circumstances, certain people evict the inner peace inside of them, just by me hanging out with them or being in those situations, I should do anything, everything possible to create what we call blessed distance from those people or from those situations so I don't ever have to fall again, so I can preserve my inner peace. And this defense of the inner peace is the whisper of the Holy Spirit. I know this is a little digression of the, of the topic, but <clears throat> this Jezebel was a woman who was giving some sort of spiritual comfort to these Christians by deluding them into sin. And the, what basically this Bishop of Theatira was experiencing was a, a spiritual insecurity, if you will. Instead of cutting her off, confronting her, telling her the truth, and telling the community, the church, he was allowing her to function because he fell into one sin that we all, especially the priests and the bishops, can fall into. It's called man-pleasing. In church, we use the word choveko ugodie. Um, means... Um, pleasing the other people out of kindness, out of politeness, in order not to be offensive, not to be this. I go along with that uh, story, with that uh, person, and I don't reprimand him for, for the damages he is doing. But if you're a bishop or a priest, you have to do this because you're not here to be liked and loved by the people. You're not here on a popularity contest. You're here 
to shepherd the flock that God has entrusted you with. Otherwise, Christ will, Christ will remove the lampstand uh, from us, the priests, or the bishops, and, and, or the church congregation. In other words, we cannot allow heresies in the church to say, well, I don't want to offend them, but so I'll let him be. And he can start spreading his nonsense uh, here or whatever, uh, heretical teachings, and I'll, I'll just quietly go along. No, we need to stand uh, against those people, not to be offensive in a sense to, to offend them or unkind in loving way, but to tell the truth as it is and warn the flock if needed to. So this bishop was obvious and lacking. This Jezebel was a real historical person on the one hand. On the other hand, she is a pure metaphor, not just from, from the, for, for that Jezebel that lived in the Old Testament that we know of, but also that we read in the book of Kings, but also for every future Jezebel that the church experienced. Uh, people who pretended that they were prophets, that they were apostles. Today we have bunch of them, uh, especially on the internet, and everyone who calls themselves, they know everything. They uh, they interpret the revelation, they interpret the everything, and they do more damage uh, to, to the chosen flock, especially if people don't have spiritual discernment, they don't have spiritual fathers, they don't live a life of church in the mysteries, and they are not guided spiritually in order to discern those. Spirits. That's why discernment is more, I mean, one of the most important gifts that the Holy Spirit has given. Yeah, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask uh, if something is maybe confusing or, or it doesn't make sense or you just, you know, if I, if I can answer, I will answer. If not, maybe we can uh, wrap it up for, for tonight. It's 7.25. Uh, with, uh, we will, thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone, for being here. We have a liturgy tomorrow pre-sanctified, not here. We're all going to Stilton from 6.30. If someone needs the address, just type St. Nicholas Serbian Orthodox Church, Stilton, PA, and you will find the address. There is a website and everything. Uh, they have a huge parking lot, so you can easily park there. Uh, maybe 15 minutes earlier, just to make sure that uh, you're on time. Uh, we'll, um, after that, I don't know if they probably will have like a little lunch or some dinner after like usually in our parish here. So anyway, come tomorrow, um, God willing, we have paraclesis, we have uh, liturgy on Friday morning, tomorrow, Thursday, and tomorrow, and after tomorrow, we have, of course, the Lenten hours, we have that every day. Friday morning, we have Vespers with the liturgy of uh, St. John Chrysostomos, it's uh, the Annunciation of the Most Holy Pentecost. and Saturday, we have, Friday evening, we have paraclesis, Saturday morning, we have, uh, again, from 8.30, liturgy. It's Lazarus Saturday. We have a baptism at 12.30 on Saturday. And then Sunday, Palm Sunday. Then uh, the following week is the Passion Week. I'll post the uh, schedule of services in case uh, wants to, someone wants to know more. So that will be all for, for now. We'll take a break from the Bible studies and catechism classes for a couple of, or three, four weeks from now. And then we'll continue as usual every Tuesday and Wednesday. Okay, let's say the prayer. And uh, then we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, into the ages of ages. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, into the ages of ages. Amen. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Through the prayers of our holy fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy in us and save us. Amen.